Chapter Four. Mr. Hopkins remained but a short time in the office of overseer. Why his career was so short, I do not know. But suppose he lacked the necessary severity to suit Colonel Lloyd. Mr. Hopkins was succeeded by Mr. Austin Gore, a man possessing, in an eminent degree, all those traits of character indispensable to what is called a first-rate overseer. Mr. Gore had served Colonel Lloyd in the capacity of overseer upon one of the out farms and had shown himself worthy of the high station of overseer upon the home or great house farm. Mr. Gore was proud, ambitious, and persevering. He was artful, cruel, and obdurate. He was just such, he was just the man for such a place. And it was just the place for such a man. It afforded scope for the full exercise of all of his powers, and he seemed to be perfectly at home in it. He was one of those who could torture the slightest look, word, or gesture on the part of the slave into impudence and would treat it accordingly. There must be no answering back to him. No explanation was allowed a slave, showing himself to have been wrongfully accused. Mr. Gore acted fully up to the maximum laid down by the slaveholders. It is better that a dozen slaves should suffer under the lash than that the overseer should be convicted in the presence of the slaves of having been at fault. So, no matter how innocent a slave might be, it availed him nothing when accused by Mr. Gore of any misdemeanor. To be accused was to be convicted, and to be convicted was to be punished. The one always followed the other with immutable certainty. To escape punishment was to escape accusation, and few slaves had the fortune to do either under the overseership of Mr. Gore. He was just proud enough to demand the most debasing homage of the slave and quite servile enough to crouch himself at the feet of the master. He was ambitious enough to be contented with nothing short of the highest rank of overseers and persevering enough to reach the height of his ambition. He was cruel enough to inflict the severest punishment artful enough to descend to the lowest trickery and obdurate enough to be insensible to the voice of a reproving conscience. He was, of all the overseers, the most dreaded by the slaves. His presence was painful. His eye flashed confusion and seldom was his sharp, shrill voice heard without producing horror and trembling in their ranks. Mr. Gore was a grave man, and though a young man, he indulged in no jokes, said no funny words, seldom smiled. His words were in perfect keeping with his looks, and his looks were in perfect keeping with his words. Overseers will sometimes indulge in a witty word or even with the slaves. Not so with Mr. Gore. He spoke but to command and commanded but to be obeyed. He dealt sparingly with his words and bountifully with his wit, never using the former where the latter would answer as well. When he whipped he seemed to do so from a sense of duty and feared no consequences. He did nothing reluctantly, no matter how disagreeable, always at his post, never inconsistent. He never promised but to fulfill. He was, in a word, a man of the most inflexible firmness 
and stone-like coolness. His savage barbarity was equaled only by the consummate coolness with which he committed the grossest and most savage deeds upon the slaves under his charge. Mr. Gore once undertook to whip one of Colonel Lloyd's slaves by the name of Demby. He had given Demby but few stripes when, to get rid of the scourging, he ran and plunged himself into a creek and stood there at the depth of his shoulders, refusing to come out. Mr. Gore told him that he would give him three calls and that if he did not come out at the third call, he would shoot him. The first call was given. Demby made no response, but stood his ground. The second and third calls were given with the same result. Mr. Gore, then, without consultation or deliberation with anyone, not even giving Demby an additional call, raised his musket to his face, taking deadly aim at his standing victim, and in an instant, poor Demby was no more. His mangled body sank out of sight, and blood and brains marked the water where he had stood. A thrill of horror flashed through every soul upon the plantation, excepting Mr. Gore. He alone seemed cool and collected. He was asked by Colonel Loy and my old master why he resorted to this extraordinary expedient. His reply was, as well as I can remember, that Denby had become unmanageable that he was setting a dangerous example to the other slaves, one which, if suffered to pass without some such demonstration on his part, would finally lead to the total subversion of all rule and order upon the plantation. He argued that if one slave refused to be corrected and escape with his life, the other slaves would soon copy the example, the result of which would be the freedom of the slaves and the enslavement of the whites. Mr. Gore's defense was satisfactory. He was continued in his station as overseer upon the home plantation. His fame as an overseer went abroad. His horrid crime was not even submitted to judicial investigation. It was committed in the presence of slaves, and they, of course, could neither institute a suit nor testify against him. And thus, the guilty perpetrator of one of the bloodiest and most foul murders goes unwhipped of justice and uncensured by the community in which he lives. Mr. Gore lived in St. Michael's, Talbot County, Maryland, when I left there. And if he's still alive, he very probably lives there now. And if so, he is now, as he was then, as highly esteemed and as much respected as though his guilty soul had not been stained with his brother's blood. I speak advisedly when I say this, that killing a slave or any colored person in Talbot County, Maryland, is not treated as a crime, either by the courts or the community. Mr. Thomas Landman of St. Michael's killed two slaves, one of whom he killed with a hatchet by knocking his brains out. He used to boast of the commission of that awful and bloody deed. I have heard him do so laughingly, saying, among other things, that he was the only benefactor of his country in the company 
and that when others would do as much as he had done, we should be relieved of the quote unquote, the damned N-word. The wife of Mr. Giles Hicks, living but a short distance from where I used to live, murdered my wife's cousin. A young girl between 15 and 16 years of age, mangling her person in the most horrible manner, breaking her nose and breastbone with a stick so that the poor girl expired in a few hours afterward. She was immediately buried, but had not been in her untimely grave but a few hours before she was taken up and examined by the coroner who decided that she had come to her death by severe beating. The offense for which this girl was thus murdered was this. She had been set that night to mind Mrs. Hicks' baby. And during the night, she fell asleep. And the baby cried. She, having lost her rest for several nights previous, did not hear the crying. They were both in a room with Mrs. Hicks. Mrs. Hicks, finding the girl slow to move, jumped from her bed, seized an oak stick of wood by the fireplace, and with it broke the girl's nose and her breastbone, and thus ended her life. I will not say that this most horrid murder produced no sensation in the community. It did produce sensation, but not enough to bring the murderess to punishment. There was a warrant issued for her arrest, but it was never served. Thus she escaped not only punishment, but even the pain of being arraigned before a court for her horrid crime. Whilst I am detailing bloody deeds, which took place during my stay on Colonel Lloyd's plantation, I will briefly narrate another, which occurred about the same time as the murder of Demby by Mr. Gore. Colonel Lloyd's slaves were in the habit of spending a part of their nights and Sundays in fishing for oysters, and in this way made up the deficiency of their scanty allowance. An old man belonging to Colonel Lloyd, while thus engaged, happened to get beyond the limits of Colonel Lloyd's and on the premises of Mr. Beale Bonley. At this trespass, Mr. Bonley took offense and with his musket came down to the shore and blew its deadly contents into the poor old man. Mr. Bonley came over to see Colonel Lloyd the next day, whether to pay him for his property or to justify himself in what he had done, I know not. At any rate, this whole fiendish transaction was soon just hushed up. There was very little said about it at all and nothing done. It was a common saying, even among little white boys, that it was worth a half cent to kill a quote unquote N-word and a half cent to bury one.